thank you for sharing your time with us this morning. We hope that this information can be of value of you for you as you struggle to uh, kind of navigate this new maze known as the Affordable Care Act. I'm sitting here this morning in the heartland looking out my window, and it uh, looks like there's a storm rolling in, and I can imagine as business owners we all feel the same way as we try and approach this issue, uh, especially uh, this law, as it feels like a storm with all of this uncertainty that we don't really know how we're going to handle. More information for you today. Uh, Brian, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, sure. So we wanted to put a little bit uh, about information in in this presentation to, to kick it off because that's essentially what ED Bellis does. We provide information that's reliable and valuable uh, to people and help them navigate like this, move through the compliance. And uh, we feel that providing inf people the right information uh, so they make the best decisions that are needed because if you advance to the next slide, uh, you will see that when there is a lack of information, a lot of things start to come up that don't necessarily uh, hold hold any truth. And that's where myths and disinformation and other things come out. And as I deal with how, how my job works, I look at how 10% um, of my job breaks down is to uh, essentially clarifying myth, disinformation, and everything, and helping people who are still in the dark uh, figure out these things. And so uh, we, we're glad that you're here. I'm going to hand it over to Brian to get into some of the meat of the things. And then um, we will update, after his remarks, we will update you on the latest developments and then talk about the pay or play analysis, what we're seeing businesses do, and the two thought processes that we believe are most important. So, Brian? Sure. Thanks, Sean. Um, you know, like Sean said, uh, people are still in the dark regarding the, uh, the marketplace or exchanges. Uh, those terms are used interchangeably. Um, and in the absence of good information, people uh, do have to make things up. Uh, we are just a couple of months away before the exchanges are set to go live, and they are, are the cornerstone of the largest uh, public policy uh, change in a generation. Um, and they will change fundamentally uh, a large portion of our uh, economy. Uh, but we are still in the dark uh, due to the lack of information being released by the federal government. I think they are working on a timeline and releasing as much information as they can, uh, but the timelines are uh, are pretty narrow. Um, and carriers also are, are very tight-lipped about uh, the, the rates and plan designs and things uh, in the marketplace because of a risk of adverse selection and uh, market-based decisions. So there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty uh, regarding the uh, marketplace's uh, functionality, affordability, sustainability, and efficacy. So uh, the, the problem is a lack of information. However, there is enough information for um, businesses to uh, make decisions, and we're going to be going over uh, that uh, today. I always like to say this next slide, because of this lack of information, I call it the ACA Bigfoot of American law because more people believe in Bigfoot, haunted houses, or aliens and believe that this law actually is is a real thing. And uh, a, a key point to remember is beginning next year, everybody in America is going to have to have health insurance uh, due to the individual mandate. The employer mandate was obviously delayed, the enforcement of it for one year, but remember that uh, individual insurance will still remote, become prevalent and it's important consideration. Next slide. Okay, here are a couple of updates since we've probably last spoke. I encourage you to check out healthreformexplained.com. That is our website, and we have regular information uh, every every day almost updated on there. Uh, open enrollment begins October 1st of 2013, and now that's when these new marketplaces begin, but that's also where you're going to see uh, individuals without insurance be, be filling out applications uh, to try and uh, qualify for premium tax credit subsidies and other things to be able to purchase health insurance. That will begin January 1st, 2014. An important point for you to note is that this first open enrollment period is longer than the ones that will be in in subsequent years. And And the reason behind that is they want to get as many people on the plan as they can this first year. 
And so the open enrollment this first year will be October 1st until March 31st, so October 1st, 2013, to March 31st, 2014. And then in subsequent years, it will mirror Medicare Part D, and that will be October 1st through December 7th. And so it's going to be important to be out in front of this issue uh, measuring your employees uh, because that's going to be very important for certain industries like the ones uh, that we're essentially working with today. Next slide, please. I, I, I spoke to the individual mandate, I think everybody knows, but an, an important point I wanted to bring up is this issue of these advanced premium tax credits. And people that make up, up to a certain amount, uh, those that make up to 250% of the poverty level get extra assistance. And they're able to apply for some of that assistance in advance. And the regulations delaying the employer mandate relaxed some of those um, essentially checks and balances for those individuals. And so there could be a lot of folks going to get a benefit that they may not necessarily uh, qualify for. They may lie about their income or other things. And that's going to be a big mess for the for the public to, to, to handle. And it could be challenging for businesses as well uh, because this employer mandate, again, begins January 1st, 2015. And, we're, and the feds in their transitional documentation are encouraging employers to voluntarily comply in 2014. And so we're going to present some ideas here in a second, some ideas um, that you should be following here in the next you know, 18 months to make sure that you're, you're not going to you know, get caught behind with what's coming down the pike in 2015. Next slide, please. I put this slide in because it's the dog days of summer, if you will, for you baseball fans. But I wanted to give you an idea of how inefficient the federal government is essentially in enforcing and uh, handling some of the deliverables in this law. Now, everybody hears how this law was a 2,000-page bill, and it was actually not quite that long, more like six or 700 pages. But the problem is it was an outline. And almost 1,700 times in the Affordable Care Act, they give the authority to the executive branch to do something as minuscule as developing a report for Congress to creating a health insurance exchange, which is obviously the largest technology cost in U.S. history that's not related to the Defense Department. And they're about on time 32% of the time. So in, that, in baseball terms, that's pretty good. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, that's not. And you'll see as more and more delays come out, it's because the federal government simply is not built to be able to handle some of the strains that are put on it because of the Affordable Care Act. I would note that of the things that they are on time, they happen to be uh, the new taxes in the law. When the IRS official in charge of enforcing that was pressed at a Ways and Means hearing, he assured that the IRS is on target. But as far as some of the consumer protections and other things in the law, uh, they're still trying to figure out how to make it all work. And so that's something to pay attention to. And as we get into this decision crunch time, how do you best make the the decision? And we understand that it's it's completely overwhelming and, and you folks go into business because you're passionate about what you do and the last thing you want to do is, you know, struggle with having to learn a, ho a whole new law. But we're here to help you uh, with the rest of the content of this newsletter, and we will be answering your questions uh, very, very shortly. After I, I think, Brian, it's your, you're up uh, to go through your process as far as the two scenarios, pay or play, how to kind of understand navigating that decision, what you should do when you make that decision, and then how to move forward. So, Brian? Thanks, Sean. And, uh, by the way, if anyone has any questions, there's a little um, balloon icon uh, that you can click and type your questions in that chat box, and we'll save some time at the end to, to get to them. Um, but uh, moving forward, obviously, uh, we are here to help you on the bottom of this line to, to mitigate the things about the law that you cannot change, uh, to assist you at changing the things you can, and providing you with the information uh, to know the difference uh, between those two. And that's kind of how we uh, look about um, our, our position. Um, I'm going to... Um, Move forward, uh, Sean. Before I continue, you want to cover this official oh, yeah, employer report about that real, real fast. The official employer report. This is something to to put on your radar. There hasn't been adequate information come out, but 
during a Ways and Means hearing that I touched on uh, last or a couple minutes ago, it would have been about two weeks ago, they had the two officials in charge of you know, enforcing the Affordable Care Act, so very, very important individuals as far as understanding how this is going to work. And they kept talking about this official employer report. And what I've found in my research is this official employer report will be on your taxes in 2016. And it's going to be, uh, it's going to require all employers to limp, you know, list how many employees they have, whether or not they offer health insurance, and a bunch of the other uh, requirements under the law. And so that's why they're encouraging people to start thinking about these things, thinking about your business in 2016, how many are you going to be employing, and uh, and figuring out kind of your approach, because 2016 tax season is kind of a hard deadline that they're throwing out there that we wanted you to be aware of. And we have more on that on Health Reform Explained. So thanks, Brian. Yep. So uh, how do you make a decision on uh, whether to uh, pay or play? And uh, after you make that decision, what's the process uh, to implement that decision? Um, what are the things you need to be concerned about? Um, and uh, we're going to outline that for you. Uh, so the way, the, decision, the way we see the decision-making process is the first thing you have to do is get the information you need to make a right decision on whether you are going to either uh, keep or establish a group-based health insurance plan or uh, send your uh, employees to the marketplace to access coverage uh, through that vehicle. Now, whatever you do decide, uh, employee communication is going to be a huge uh, factor. Obviously, uh, employers are uh, wanting their employees to uh, see that the company cares for them and the company has a vested interest in their health and well-being. So we're going to put that in the bigger picture as far as your human capital management. Uh, whether or not you choose uh, either way, uh, obviously there's going to be some compliance issues, um, and we're going to go over some of the big ones. Uh, there are some very important things uh, that we need to touch on uh, with that. So that's the process that I'm going to take you through today. And, of course, the first is the pay or play. Um, companies of all sizes are going to have to conduct a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, what we have found at ED Bellis when we do these, uh, most are not in as bad shape as they anticipated. Um, however, they're going to need a strategy because of changes evolving in the law. Um, the, the, the research that you do now uh, is, is changing and, and evolving. Uh, right here in the middle here, this is a key one here. A pay-or-play cost-benefit analysis can be completed it's based on your uh, employer uh, data uh, and your employee demographics combined with a health insurance uh, market study. Um, and it can only be done using your company's specific data. Uh, in informed decisions can't be made based on what other people are doing or, or anecdotal information. It really is a one-on-one -on -one, uh, measurement of your situation. But again, it is dr driven by the size of your company, how much your employees make, uh, and the industry and benefit structure that you're you're in. Um, in some cases, it makes better sense to pay the penalty, uh, and that is because if your employee's salary is low, uh, the cost of providing affordable coverage, which is the amount that the employer has to subsidize to reach a certain level, is greater than the penalty of uh, not providing coverage at all. So there is a break-even point uh, for an employer and also a break-even point as far as the employee's premium uh, in the marketplace versus the premium in your group-based plan. Uh, so you have to find that break-even point. Um, a lot of employees uh, in, uh, in blue-collar industries uh, and a lot of the industries that we're, we're working with are actually almost better served in the marketplace because of subsidies. And then also, uh, if their income falls below 250%, they also receive help with their out-of-pocket costs. Uh, and this is how it looks in the marketplace. So uh, if you're under 133% of federal poverty or 100% uh, percent of uh, poverty in our state of Nebraska, uh, because we did not expand uh, Medicaid, but some states have, uh, you can receive uh, help through that program. Uh, and up to 250%, you get advanced premium tax credit and cost-sharing reductions to help you with your out-of-pocket costs. And those are scaled uh, to the point where when you reach 400% of federal poverty level, which is um, over 90000 uh, for a family of four, then you pay the full cost of insurance. And that's the marketplace in a nutshell. So once you've made that decision, uh, 
what does it look like and what strategies and um, considerations should you be looking at? So let's cover first if you're going to pay the penalty. Uh, if you do decide to send your employees to the marketplace, the, the main strategy that's going to be in play is to minimize uh, the penalties uh, that you are going to pay, which is $2,000 per employee per year. And you can um, make your company look as small as possible uh, to uh, the government. And there's no one, one golden uh, arrow uh, as far as to, to make your company appear small. It is uh, many uh, small areas that need to be addressed. Um, so we're just going to cover on what they are uh, just because of time today. Uh, but there is plenty of information, like Sean said, uh, on our website. And uh, feel free to, to contact us, and we can provide you with a little bit more information. The first is establishing the right look-back period. Uh, that's basically the measurement period of when the government's going to hold up their yardstick uh, to measure how many employees you have. Uh, the next is to onboard employees as variable or part-time. Uh, you can actually, uh, depending on the attrition in your industry, uh, significantly reduce uh, the size of your company in terms of the law. Uh, by establishing a long uh, variable uh, initial measurement period. You can use temporary employees. You can use part-time employees. Um, it's unfortunate, of course, that so many uh, companies had to uh, reduce their employees' hours to under 30, uh, and then the, then the mandate was delayed for yet another year, and they had made a, a pretty hard uh, business decision as, as far as uh, human resources that, uh, that ended up not, not paying off in the end. Uh, but that is going to be a strategy uh, moving forward. There are multiple other strategies that are out there um, that take a little bit more uh, care and due diligence because there are compliance issues. Uh, that is with 1099s, uh, with leased employees and employee sharing. Um, those can be used, uh, but they have to be used within uh, the confines of uh, the regulations and the law. So that's if you send your employees to the marketplace, your major considerations. But what if you decide to play along? Well, play along, we mean establish a group-based plan. Uh, well, employers uh, are going to be operating in, in, in a new environment in 2014. Um, a, a lot of employers have already received their, their renewals uh, already, uh, but uh, a lot of them are going to see the renewals that they've received right now are based on their current uh, market functions. So they, they don't have the, the health insurance marketplace or the Affordable Care Act's uh, mandates in them quite yet. Uh, but they will uh, come in 2014, and they are uh, expecting a lot of companies to experience what we call rate shock. Uh, that is because right now, uh, if you are healthy or young or uh, a, a male-dominated workforce, uh, then you're actually getting credit uh, for all those uh, aspects. Uh, but that's going to go away because the uh, companies will be subject to a community rating. Um, it's under 50 uh, now, and then it will be uh, under 100 employees uh, here later on. Uh, there will be several new mandates and taxes. You can also, if you're a small employer, choose to participate through a shop exchange. That is going to be a market-based uh, uh, type plan. Um, and if you do decide to, to go to the shop exchange, you actually receive, you can receive a premium uh, tax uh, or a t tax credit as an employer, uh, so you could actually receive a, a credit um, based on how, how big your company is and how many employees that you have. Um, if you do offer group-based uh, coverage, of course, you do get a pretty good tax advantage because they are made uh, with pre-tax dollars. Uh, however, in the marketplace or exchange, all premiums and penalties are made with after-tax dollars, so you have to uh, talk to your CPA about that. This is the marketplace reforms in a nutshell. Uh, this are why kind of uh, premiums are going to be going up for some people and, and down for others. Uh, there won't be any uh, premium rating or denials based on health status or gender, uh, and there will be very, really big limits on how much you can charge an, an older person compared to a younger person at a, at a rate factor of one to three. Uh, there will be a single uh, risk pool, so there won't be any uh, advantage for being a, a healthier group. Uh, we're all going to be put in one uh, basic uh, demographic, one pool that's going to be based on location. Uh, depending on your state, it may be different. It may be a city or a, a zip code or, or, or something like that, but it will be based just simply on your location. And that coverage is going to be guaranteed uh, to be available and uh, guaranteed uh, to be uh, kept and renewed with 
uh, when it says limited exceptions, but that's really only if you move out of the area. So that's if you play along uh, with the Affordable Care Act, but there is another option of playing by yourself because uh, some people, I guess, don't uh, play well with others, and that is uh, talking about uh, self-insurance. Um, there has been a dramatic rise, uh, uh, in some places a 6,000% increase in the percentage of employers that are using a self-insured uh, business model over the past 12 years. Uh, what that means is uh, that the employer actually uh, is responsible for some of the claims. Uh, cost and you can limit that based on uh, different kind of insurance programs, um, but it's it's not a premium only plan. So you are combining a, a premium for like a, a stop loss uh, combined with uh, some claim exposure. Um, it can be uh, designed to look pretty much exactly like a fully insured plan, um, but uh, it, what it does is allows you to avoid the community rating. So with all those marketplace reforms that uh, we talked about, uh, if you are self insured. Uh, you can you can bypass them. Uh, you can also have a flexibility in plan design, uh, so you have much greater uh, ability to decide uh, what that cost sharing is going to be and uh, what services and uh, and programs that the uh, the plan will will pay for, uh, of course, within the confines of some uh, regulations. But uh, you do have the ability to control costs. You can actually see uh, to give you an example, uh, there may be uh, a, a drug uh, that costs 5000 at one location and uh, 2000 at another, um, it's, it's, it's amazing. But the ability to control those costs is, uh, is a dramatic benefit to this kind of plan. Um, the other thing is uh, reform actually makes self-insurance more attractive to some employers uh, because uh, what they'll be able to do is when they're healthy, uh, they can self-insure and take advantage of that, uh, that good claim experience, but if something happens and, and they're no longer healthy or they're, they're getting some high claims, they can just transition back into uh, the community rating plan at will. Uh, so it removes actually some of the barriers that small companies had to self-funding because they have a way out uh, without having to, to, be, to be hit really hard on a premium rate up uh, when they do so. Um, so those are some of the, the basic options, the pay or play options, and what your concerns uh, are with those. However, no matter what you decide, uh, obviously it's an employee-based uh, uh, decision. And how your employees uh, respond to it and how it's communicated is going to go a long way to whether it's successful or not. Uh, and we know that as an employer, uh, we have a vested interest in the health and well-being of our employees. Uh, if they are healthy, uh, they perform better, uh, they're at work more, uh, they have a higher satisfaction uh, with their job, uh, they stay with us, and uh, obviously if we have a healthy workforce, uh, we can attract uh, more employees to, to our company. Um, health insurance is a large part, but it's still a single uh, piece of a, a competitive employee benefit or a competitive human capital management uh, strategy. Uh, so no matter what you decide, there are going to be concerns based on communication. Um, so if you have an exchange-based plan and you're deciding to send employees to the marketplace, uh, the first thing I'll, I'll let employers know is the stigma of an employer dropping group coverage or not offering uh, benef health benefits is history. It's a thing of the past because the effect of the market reforms basically commoditizes uh, health insurance. What it means is there's no longer a risk of dropping coverage and your employees uh, being denied coverage for a pre-existing condition. There's no risk of dropping coverage and having them uh, wait uh, a waiting period uh, before uh, a service is covered. There's no risk of unaffordable coverage. Uh, the whole market has changed. However, this fact needs to be effectively communicated. Uh, if it's not, of course, the employees can, can have a general understanding that, well, you know, my company doesn't offer benefits, so they must not um, invest in, in their employees or, or care uh, about my health and well-being, which could be the absolute opposite uh, case and, and is the opposite case in, in, in most cases, but um, communication is the key. Uh, so in order to maintain a productive and engaged workforce, uh, we're going to need to ensure that employees under this type of model don't miss an open enrollment or a special enrollment opportunity. Sean said uh, earlier what the enrollment period is going to be initially. There's multiple uh, communication points uh, during that period and during other life events uh, and things like that that are going to have to be monitored by 
second employer. Employers need to help uh, employees choose a plan that meets their needs. Um, you know, sometimes just uh, not knowing about health insurance or carriers or what a deductible is or what a copayment is or any of those things, if these employees go to the marketplace and, and do that self-service, it's not guaranteed that they're going to choose the right plan for them. Uh, it actually is, is a process that, that should be made with some professional uh, advice. Uh, that can be done uh, through uh, an agent. Uh, it can be done uh, through uh, multiple uh, ways, and ED Bells uh, does help uh, with some communication pieces on that if, if you're interested. Um, they need to understand the process of enrollment uh, and, and when effective dates are and, and things like that to avoid uh, some unnecessary expenses. And as Sean said, they're going to have to be aware of premium subsidy clawbacks. And I'm going to cover just one real fast with you. And that is if an if a employee is promoted or, or makes more money, uh, it's good. Uh, however, it could put them into a different income bracket in the marketplace. And when they file their taxes at the end of the year, if they had said that they uh, qualified for one subsidy, uh, but their increase in income qualifies them for another, that uh, will be clawed back on their tax return. Uh, so actually, if you give an employee a raise that puts them over the hump of one of those subsidies, you'd actually have to bump them up a couple more percent just to take the increase in health insurance premiums uh, and to, to overcome that, that barrier. Uh, so that's uh, an interesting thing about the law. Of course, as employees make more, uh, they will pay more, pay more uh, for health insurance under the exchange-based plan, and there's nothing an employer can really uh, do about that. The other thing I want to share is uh, kind of what the marketplace does and does not do, uh, because uh, in, in there are uh, things that it's good at and other things employers are still going to have to be concerned about. Uh, the good thing is employees may be spending less on health insurance uh, because of the subsidies and they can focus on other aspects of their financial security, and it is in an employer's best interest uh, to uh, help their employees be financially secure uh, and, and, health, and healthy. Um, so coverage in the marketplace will have several weaknesses uh, that can be addressed with employer-sponsored programs. Uh, one of those is going to be provider access. A lot of the networks inside of the marketplace are going to be skinny, uh, which means there won't be a lot of access to special specialized uh, doctors or, or, or a variety of hospitals. They may just have one or two hospitals and, and a few clinics. And uh, there's going to be, uh, it's predicted that there's going to be a lot of uh, shortage uh, because of the new uh, people entering the marketplace uh, and the demand for services. So employers do have a, a large part to play there. The uh, marketplace does not uh, provide any help uh, for life, uh, disability. Um, let me go back here one. Uh, for life, disability, or vision, or uh, very little on dental. So all those other ancillary coverages, they're not touched uh, by the marketplace. Um, all your voluntary options, such as your accident plans, your cancer plans, all your uh, AFLAC-type plans, um, those also um, are not going to be covered. Another thing is, uh, specifically uh, in um, some areas, people, they don't necessarily uh, need or, or, or want to see a traditional doctor. The, uh, the services that are covered in the marketplace are actually uh, defined uh, and determined uh, by the federal government. Um, and it, it, just like normal insurance, they don't include a lot of naturopathic uh, and, uh, and, and other type of options uh, that employers can actually help uh, with their employees. And the other thing that I think is a glaring weakness in the marketplace is there is actually no uh, fitness or wellness programs uh, in there. So uh, any fitness programs, nutrition, uh, chronic condition management, stress management, all those type of, of programs are things that an employer will still have to uh, address to, to fill in the gaps in the marketplace. So if you do have an employer-based plan uh, where you are keeping group-based coverage, uh, we, you need to, first of all, be, avail, be uh, aware uh, that offering an employee that type of coverage does remove their eligibility uh, for a subsidy in the marketplace. So it does kind of uh, drive them back onto your group plan. Um, however, uh, even if you cover your employees, the decision uh, for that employee's de dependence uh, could be drastically different. I know um, it just uh, came out. Uh, I know the UPS uh, did it, and now a lot of other large companies, really large companies, are removing spousal coverage uh, from their employer-based coverage and saying, 
uh, that spouses are going to have to um, find uh, coverage elsewhere. And that is actually because of health care reform. Uh, it has uh, removed uh, a spouse uh, as a, a dependent. So a spouse is no longer considered uh, a, de a dependent under a lot of insurance plans. Um, the other thing is all those other family members may be able to receive exchange subsidies. So if you say, um, I'm not covering your spouse, uh, that may give that spouse uh, an eligibility for subsidy in the marketplace. Um, employers need to be prepared on how to answer questions from employees who shopped on the exchange. Um, there are going to be some different conversations in regards to employees uh, seeking coverage for their spouses and dependents and, and where they go and how much it costs and what the employer can do with that. So we need to be prepared uh, with some good uh, communication on, on that point. Now we're going to cover uh, some, some key things here, um, and uh, specifically uh, with compliance, uh, there is a stepped-up uh, push by the federal government to enforce compliance as a means of funding the law. So um, it's, it, is, uh, it is a measurable increase, uh, and it is, it is purposeful. So we're going to cover uh, some of the compliance concerns on, on both type of plants, um, so if all employers, first of all, have to issue a marketplace notification to employees by October 1st, it's really simple, actually, uh, and on the Department of Labor's website, uh, you can download uh, that form and, uh, and provide that to employees. There is going to be compliance concerns for all employers who have to uh, show uh, reporting requirements, but that has been delayed. Uh, you may notice uh, that that is a trend. Uh, the non-discrimination penalties uh, were delayed. No one really talks about them anymore because they're actually delayed uh, soon after the bill was passed. However, there is a, a lot of um, a lot of people out there that that are that are hearing things and that uh, see um, this as you know, going into effect uh, sooner rather than later. And uh, the reason why I bring it up now to you is just so that you can be aware. Uh, to make some advanced uh, changes in your benefit program uh, in preparation for these penalties because the penalties are, are pretty high. There's $36,500 per employee impacted annually, so it's $100 a day per employee. Uh, what the non-discrimination uh, rules are is you have to offer all full-time employees the same coverage at the same premium. So if you're classing out employees and saying uh, here the administrative staff has a health plan, but uh, this, this uh, type of uh, employee uh, does not, uh, the managers have, health, have the health plan, but uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the line staff does not, um, all that is going to have to, to go away uh, here, here soon. Right now it is turned off, but, uh, but be aware of that. Um, if you do offer uh, benefits, you will be faced with a few more uh, regulations um, than if you don't offer insurance. Uh, and I say a few more, but uh, I, sh I should actually say significant. Uh, first of all, there is a new Section 7 of ERISA. It is the health care reform uh, provisions. And there is a self-test, uh, self-compliance tool on the DOL's website. I can send out the link to that as well. Uh, that you'll have to uh, complete to ensure that your plan is in compliance, specifically uh, if you are self-funded. Uh, a complete overview of, uh, of these compliance uh, things in, in ERISA and Section 7 is out of the scope for this uh, presentation, but it is something that uh, we are prepared to, to work with business owners on should they choose so. Um, many carriers' fully insured products have been brought into compliance with Section 7 of ERISA, so that means they are brought into compliance with health care reform. However, uh, ERISA is a whole different story, um, and this is something that uh, is a hot topic right now, because although uh, those plans may be compliant with uh, health care reform, uh, you cannot rely on the carrier to produce ERISA compliance uh, documents uh, for your plan, um, and this is a key point here. Uh, employers of any size uh, that offer any type of health and wellness must uh, have uh, maintain compliance with ERISA. Uh, so the reason that no one has heard about this is because there's been a tremendous lack of enforcement of ERISA. But uh, when the IRS was uh, tasked to uh, enforce health enforce, uh, healthcare reform, uh, they really kind of made uh, a little bit of a stink and said, uh, you know, the Department of Labor is supposed to 
uh, is supposed to, you know, make sure ERISA compliance and enforce that, but they're not uh, doing that. So why do we have to do health care reform? So uh, the DOL ponied up, and uh, they have decided they are going to enforce ERISA. So right now, uh, there's not a lot of um, talk about it for small employers, but uh, actually, um, it's it's coming. Ninety-five uh, percent of all employers are found to be out of compliance with this law, and the Department of Labor is dramatically increasing the number of compliance audits. Uh, they are committed to, committed to auditing every employer by 2018. Uh, they've opened up new regional office, offices and hired uh, 3,000 new agents. Um, some of the states where the DOL is already fully staffed are going to be first in line, such as California and Texas. Um, and audits are being initiate, initiated via email with no further notification before penalties start to accrue, which is 10 days. Um, so I do have some, uh, some more information on this. It's something that uh, we need to, every employer that offers a plan is going to have to do. Um, it's, it's not extremely costly to do so, um, but it, it must be done. Okay, kind of finishing up the, the, the rest of the presentation here uh, for my part. Um, this is uh, actually pulled off of healthcare.gov. Uh, it's a useful site to go to if you want to look at your first look at the marketplace. Um, and it kind of goes what the employees are going to see, where they create account, apply, uh, pick a plan, and uh, enroll. It's going to be a pretty easy uh, process, I, I, would, I would think. Uh, however, they are going to have to be prepared with uh, a number of documents. Uh, on that site, healthcare.gov, there is this marketplace application checklist that may be uh, handy to, to give to employees. It shows them all the information that they will need um, and then shows them down here. Um, obviously, there's just a little bit of information about the employee, but the government wants to know a lot of information about the employer down here and uh, what uh, type of plan uh, that is being uh, offered. So that may be your first taste of what what it's going to what it's going to look look like um, moving on uh here i will turn it back over to to sean and uh, let him uh complete uh some of the timelines and things that you should be thinking about uh and questions to ask your broker and uh some uh, mistakes to avoid all right thanks brian great job covering a lot of ground this morning and uh let's get into some key dates that i'd like you to be aware of as a business and this is coming from the transitional relief documentation that the government released after the the pay or play delay as i call it and we're still waiting the uh the final uh documentation but the th this three do three page documentation kind of gives us an idea of these key dates that i want you to be aware of and obviously number 1 is october 1st 2013 and i think we've touched on that several times here today that's when these new marketplaces are supposed to begin it's the kind of the d-day uh, for the affordable care act if they're going to make this thing happen um, they're going to have to have this thing at least open on october first and so that is really when you're going to see more and more employees start to pay attention um, you're seeing a lot of promotional efforts uh, all over the country uh, some people are wondering if it's going to be called oprah care because she's putting her firepower uh, behind it. And it's just, just going to be all over the news October 1st, and that's when the open enrollment again begins, and you're going to have employees that will probably be coming to ask you about it and uh, trying to get into it. And so that's one of the reasons why it's uh, important to start kind of thinking about these things and preparing yourself for October 1st until January 1st, 2014. It's going to probably be pretty slow I'm anticipating this first year it's going to be all over the news but I don't think it's going to really kind of get through to the public until next year and the interesting thing is folks only really have three months next year to be able to get into this new health insurance exchange and so that's kind of what's going to be happening uh, for your employees between now and, and April 1st of next year you're going to see this big push Politically, you're going to see a big push uh, through PR efforts and other things to raise awareness about Obamacare, about these new exchanges, and try and sign up as many people as they possibly can. And I think, as we've covered before, industries that, that employ people that uh, don't pay as high of amount, uh, I think those are going to be the folks that are going to be targeted because those are the ones that are going to get the most subsidies under the under the law. 
Now, after March 31st, I think, is when it's really crunch time for businesses. And one of the hard dates that I put in for people that I advise is July 1st of 2014. So a little bit less than a year from now, you really kind of need to have a strategy in place. You need to probably, by the beginning of this year, have figured out whether or not you're going to pay or play. And then from there, it's going to become an issue of, all right, how do I measure my employees? How do I make sure that I'm hiring people as part-time if I decide to, to play, uh, to keep those numbers down? And uh, because once you have that strategy in place and if you kind of start getting used to these things, measuring your employees, knowing exactly where you are, exactly where you stand, you're going to find that as as crazy and grandiose as this law is, many folks are not quite in as much problem as they are. And when that official employer report comes, which I talked about earlier, tax season 2016, uh, you will have an appropriate process in place. So to review, uh, important dates that you need to be aware of are October 1st of this year, January 1st of next year, the end of open enrollment next year, because that's when uh, em employees can go in and out of the exchange, and then January 1st or July 1st, excuse me, 2014, because that's when I believe you should probably have your decision made up and your strategy in place moving forward, because I just don't see uh, another delay. Next slide, please. This is a, 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 a these slide, next few slides are going to be some questions that I think you should ask your broker. And I'm going to talk about, when I conclude, kind of the five approaches that businesses all over the country are taking to deal with this issue. And one of them is, is relying on, on the broker or an insurance carrier if you already have one. And uh, they can definitely help answer a lot of your questions. Um, but here are some of the ones that you should be asking them because they do have a conflict of interest in some ways, and some of the advice that they're asking, because obviously uh, they get compensated for having a group plan. So what you need to ask if you have a current plan is, will this plan be in compliance beginning you know, next year under this new normal? Brian touched on it earlier, but these new plans have to meet these new standards under the Affordable Care Act. And what we're seeing is there's going to be some rate shock, and some of these plans might have to change. And so you need to make sure that if you are offering coverage, you're offering something that's not going to put you in a difficult position next year. Another question that's important is, do I apply, qualify for the small group market or the large group market? And that is going to vary by your state, but it's also going to determine how this law impacts you because there are some provisions under the Affordable Care Act that only apply for small group market, which is under 50 in some states, in some states it's under 100. And a lot of the clients that we work with that are kind of right in the wheelhouse of struggling to understand the Affordable Care Act uh, are kind of right on that, on that line. So you need to make sure that they're on top of that issue. How much should I be budgeting for health insurance premiums? Or if I decide to pay the penalty, how much should I be budgeting for that? And if, if I decide to pay the penalty, how do I make that number obviously as small as possible. One of the things that's important to know is that age banding, Brian touched on it earlier, is going to have an impact. So if you employ a younger workforce, you could see premiums go up disproportionately. And if you employ a uh, an older workforce, you might actually see them stay the same, but you should have an idea and your broker should have an idea on how that's going to play out for you. Next question. Next slide, please. Here's another good one. Brian touched on it, and that's the issue of some of these voluntary things. I think a lot of experts, as they dissect the Affordable Care Act, wonder how this is going to impact health care providers, and, that, and therefore, how is it going to impact patients? Will there be less wait or more wait time? Will it be difficult to access care? There are incentives driving networks to become more, you know, exclusive or selective, creating called skinny networks, and so. Are there other products out there like telemedicine and other things that might be integrated that could help uh, be attractive to my employees, especially if you decide to drop coverage? Uh, and that, again, may make sense for you depending on your situation. Finally, what do I need to do to make sure I'm not getting hit with that non-discrimination? And Brian did a really good job of explaining it. 
but a lot of folks uh, could find themselves in a difficult position if they're not understanding that you can't really carve out certain employees anymore. And that's that's a really big, big change. And, and again, it's delayed, but it's important that you're not offering a plan that could, you know, be tr problematic should they change that. Next slide, please. Ten mistakes I believe businesses are making. And I'm going to kind of tie this into a movie. Uh, I don't know if you remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. There was a movie with Kevin Costner. He He's in it, and it's the, the JFK and, they, and his brother Bobby. And when when they figure out that, you know, the Russians are putting missiles on Cuba, that, that Bobby Kennedy says, you know, there's five things we can do. And the first option we can do is do nothing. And I think a lot of people are might eventually do nothing with regards to this law, and I think that's that's a big mistake. And I think avoiding the challenge is something that you shouldn't be doing. I think the other thing that's difficult as well is making a permanent decision based on something that is still being written. The first thing you need to be doing is educating yourself, trying to figure out exactly where you stand, not relying on the media, mistake number three, because that's a problem, working with a team of professional advisors, including your broker, but also asking your CPA their opinion, your attorney, um, your home offices provide good information on this as well. Um, because drastically cutting hours, which is what approach a lot of people are doing, might not necessarily be the, be something that you need to be doing. You could be replacing workers through attrition as part-time. There are other strategies than just drastically cutting hours without understanding the whole situation. The back five mistakes that I believe people are doing is not doing the full analysis. Now you see a lot of quote-unquote healthcare experts out there offering you know, free pay or play analysis, and and they may just provide a access to uh, a forecast on how it might impact the company's bottom line, but they don't understand how it's going to impact the workforce of the company, how everybody's employee is going to be impacted. You know, what is the philosophy of that company? Why do they offer benefits? I think all of those variables really need to be considered, and so therefore, not make not doing a full analysis, I believe, is a mistake that many businesses are making. Another one is not having a dialogue with employees. Uh, listen, this is kind of setting things up to make employers kind of be in a difficult position because in the past, if an employer had offered coverage, it was on the employee to come to them to uh, sign up. And now that is completely shifting that responsibility on the employer. And so I think having a discussion about this, don't be hesitant to say, hey, listen, the, the, the government is making us do these things because – I guarantee they're setting employers up to be kind of the bad guy in some ways that they're setting things up, and so it's important to be proactive with your employees on this issue. Hiring full-time without an analysis, I think uh, some people are just randomly hiring people because they think, well, this delay is fine. I'm just going to hire them now, and then I'll figure it out a year from now. Uh, probably not the best approach. Uh, the final two, not researching uh, a longer plan year option might makes sense to try and get something renewed uh, this year, let 2014 play out so you know you're okay, and then renew the following year, 2014, December. And a lot of people are doing that. And then finally, not taking advantage of advances in self-funding. It really depends on your company and the size, but there are some businesses where self-funding uh, makes, makes a lot of sense. And so you should consider all of these things. And you should also consider, finally, I'm almost done, and we'll get to your questions, which I see we have three or four. Uh, educating your employees to be better health care consumers. Brian talked about it during, you know, with self-funding, how there's all these different drugs or different prices. A neat exercise to do is to call around to a pharmacy and ask for the same drug at five different locations as if you were paying cash and just see the dramatic difference in prices. So educating people to be informed health care consumers teaching them that it's 10 times more expensive to go to the ER for a sinus infection than it would be to go to an urgent care clinic. And other things is really how you lower costs and improve the wealth, wellness and, and uh, productivity of your, of your employees. Other strategies I think you're going to see in the future are going to be things like telemedicine. A lot of things anymore can be handled with smartphones, and so I think that could help kind of relieve some of the strain coming to the healthcare system.
Next slide, please. My final remarks before we take some 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 questions. Um, a, it's not wise to be reactive with the federal government, and I think it's important to be seriously considering doing some of this voluntary compliance, voluntarily measuring your employees, making sure that it's going to be okay. Because if you, you know, if you do happen to miss something this first year, you're going to be okay. Uh, however, the next year uh, might not be, and so making for that smooth transition, I think, is going to save a lot of people. Communicating with your employees, ongoing. Um, is going to be very, very important uh, because you can control the dialogue doing that way, and I think that's going to be extremely important. And then letting others help you uh, navigate this, ones that kind of understand the big picture that can give you some objective advice and not trying to go at it alone because you know, I've been working on this law for five years, and it never ceases to amaze me uh, just how, how crazy it can become and how things can change. And and it is changing and still being written, and so constantly being on top of it is going to be be a, be a challenge, but it's going to be important for you to, to do. So I think that's all I've got, Brian. Should we take some questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we do have um, some questions that have been submitted uh, via chat, and then we're going to get to those first, and then if we do have some time, we can open it up to some, uh, to some audio questions. So um, I got one I can answer. Sure. First question is, is there a time frame for an employee to be considered temporary? If so, can a temporary employee be rehired again as temporary? The answer is, uh, f for temporary employees, there is a s exemption essentially for someone that works less than 90 days. So when you look at the temporary staffing industry, what you're seeing is staffing companies offer you know, employees for 90 days, and then it becomes, do, you, do they go on to that? Uh, employer as an employer of record, or do they remain on the staffing company? And it really depends on the staffing company. Um, but the answer is 90 days. Second part, can a temporary employee be rehired again as temporary? And the answer is yes, but it has to be after six months. Do you have anything to add on that one, Brian? No, that was, you did that well. <laughs> All right. Very good. Um, so the next question, how are we... Um, how are we supposed to help employees when uh, there may be some lack of understanding, obviously from uh, an employer's perspective, and uh, referring to employees to professional help, will that uh, be an additional cost? Uh, so uh, what, I, what I would say on that um, is that, uh, you know, as far as I'll answer the second part first, um, agents uh, and uh, navigators in the marketplace, uh, there is a place uh, for them and their compensation is actually built into the uh, insurance carrier's cost. So uh, no matter when an employee would work with an agent, um, then uh, they would actually get the same cost uh, to them, the same premium, and they wouldn't have to pay any consulting fee or anything like that. That's handled on the back end between that uh, agent uh, or producer and the insurance carriers uh, directly. Uh, there is uh, also navigators. Uh, that uh, can help employees uh, get onto the marketplace but can't advise them uh, on what plan to choose. Um, and those navigators you may find at your, uh, your community health centers and uh, various other places that, uh, that may help your employees uh, enroll. Um, so you can do it uh, without a cost to uh, your, your em employees. Uh, as far as in a cost to uh, an employer's, uh, there may be... Um, a small cost, you know, if there is uh, some uh, documents that need to be created and, and communicated and, and things like that. Um, do you have anything else to add, Sean, on that one? Uh, no, um, but that is a very good question because, you know, people probably assume that that's another cost out of their pocket. But it it is an important consideration to think about because if some of your employees, especially those that are, could be over 30, and a lot of people we work with, Sometimes they might be working with somebody that's, you know, 50 hours one week, 20 hours the next. Really, just depends. And so, um, you know, encouraging some of those people that could be uh, risky or uh, problematic to to explore that and uh, work with an agent to get on could end, actually make that employer census look smaller this first year. That's why it's important to consider, right, Brian? Yeah, absolutely. All right. What's the next question? Should a company start? to plan now or wait until 2014. I would honestly very highly encourage begin planning now and continue planning into 2014. 
Um, there's gonna, this is kind of a process. This has a 10-year implementation, but these next two or three years are kind of going to be volatile for businesses. And so I think the first thing that I would try and do is knowing exactly where I stand, doing a pay or play analysis, figuring out the decision that I want to make, and then developing an ongoing strategy that includes communication, compliance, and other things. Um, one thing I like to do is a reverse calendar. So if official employer report is 2016, start setting some deadlines, you know, moving back from then. I'm going to have my measurement strategy in place this date. I'm going to have my decision made up on this date, et cetera. Um, don't wait. So should a company start a plan now or wait till 2014? That's a tough one to, to answer uh, without the, the specifics. Um, but some, So the answer would probably be yes or no, uh, in my uh, opinion. Uh, depending on uh, the demographics of, of that employer uh, in general. Uh, the reason to establish a plan right now uh, is if your company is at risk of rate shock. So if you have healthy, uh, younger male employees, it may actually be a financial benefit to you to start a plan now that can run you longer uh, into 2014 rather than wait until 2014 and establish a plan that may be based on community rating. Um, and that's uh, a, a short answer to that, uh, but it, it, it does get kind of complex depending on employer's specific situation. And I'll go right into the next one here. Uh, an employee that has a, an amount designated as insurance in his paycheck, um, it, that can be problematic. Uh, I know right now some employers are giving employees uh, an amount to go ahead and go buy individual insurance uh, on uh, an individual plan rather than a group plan, and they're using a Section 125 uh, to do so, but that is going away in 2014. So um, for health insurance specifically, uh, it is problematic to, 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 to put that uh, in there. Obviously, if you're over 500, uh, if you're over a certain amount of employees, you're going to have to put what you actually do contribute towards, uh, towards insurance. But uh, because there's no tax advantage to do so, um, maybe this employee is doing it uh, based on an arrangement, uh, a family situation or, or something like that, and that may be a different story, but should be uh, should be looked into. So, um, If we don't have 50 employees, do, are we required to comply with the notification deadline of October 1st? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, all employers uh, need to provide uh, that that document. Um, if if you don't if you don't provide insurance, it's very uh, it's very simple. If you do, it's a little bit more complex, but but uh, still pretty easy. So everyone should do that. Um, it's important not just because it's the law, because it's compliance, but also um, I think uh, employers do have a responsibility. Uh, to provide that notice to employees so employees know where they stand and when they go to um, to the marketplace to, to sign up, the information provided in that document is going to be very useful to them, um, and uh, that's what uh, they're going to need to know. Uh, so it's a good thing for, for all employers to do, um, and uh, I think it's good for their employees as well. Maybe we can send it out with this presentation. Sure. Yeah. So then they they just have to mail it to their employees, right? Or hand it to them? Uh, yeah, uh, it, it needs to be distributed in uh, in a way that's determined uh, to uh, have a reasonable expectation of reaching uh, every single employee. So, um, it, a lot of times, work through the payroll company. Yeah, is the uh, safest way. Yeah, there, there's there's uh, there's lots of considerations there. Uh, it can be done uh, electronically if every single uh, of your employees uh, needs a computer to to do their job. If not. Um, you're going to have to rely on some other uh, means of, of doing so. Uh, payroll uh, is uh, is the most popular. Cool. Uh, so uh, that concludes uh, the um, the type comments. I open it up if anyone does have a question. Hopefully, we don't get a lot of back uh, back noise here. But uh, just open it up for a minute, and if anyone has a question, go ahead and shoot. Uh, if not. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, close uh, the presentation. There's one more that popped up, Brian. Okay, one more question. About the notification, are two, there are two options, one if they provide insurance and one if we don't, right, obviously? Yes. Um, so say this person so, doesn't presently have a plan in place but, but might intend to, which one do they have to send out? 
they would want to send out the one that they uh, intend to do. Um, so you're going to have to have a – you're going to want to make that decision uh, for employees by uh, October 1st. Uh, so uh, it would be you, – you would communicate yes, I uh, you earlier. the plan or option that you will have in force effective January 1st. Yeah. So uh, that would be the date. So it would be based on that, that, that the date of the plan that you will have at that time. At January 1st, 2014. Mm -hmm. So if they were going to wait till 2015, then they would just do the one that they're not offering okay. for this first year, right? You got it. Absolutely. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, folks? No, thank you. It's very informative. Cool. Well, we hope, uh, hope you'll visit our website, Health Reform Explained, and, um, you know, we will send a follow-up with this uh, webinar and uh, those notifications and anything else. Brian, do you have any final thoughts? Oh, thank you for uh, attending, and uh, we will uh, be doing a future webinar, so uh, be, be looking for them, uh, and uh, we'll uh, keep you informed. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you.